Suffering power failure. Ray's favourite condor is limping back. The leading yacht, 60 nautical miles east of Bermagui, was the Maxi New Zealand, skippered by experienced ocean racer Peter Blake. 10 nautical miles astern is the pocket Maxi Spirit of Queensland, with another Maxi Vengeance in third place about 20 nautical miles further north. The Cruising Yacht Club in Sydney reports that the bulk of the fleet is situated east of the fishing town of Ulladulla, south of Jarvis Bay. At last report, the leader on handicap was the Western Australian Far 20 yacht, Prime Suspect, skippered by Joe Milner. The gale force conditions on the New South Wales well, South Coast this morning were not only causing problems for the yachts. The radio relay vessel Wyuna was having its share of trouble keeping an even keel. However, it was managing to keep radio contact with the fleet as it spread along the New South Wales coastline. Amongst the leaders, and at last report still holding fifth place, was the pocket Maxi Bewinched, jointly skippered by Bill Ferris and Sam Gazzle. While the number of yachts heading down the coast dwindled rapidly during the day, a stream of vessels began limping back towards Sydney. They included fancied yachts such as Apollo, Freight Train, and the early leader Condor, which had a steering failure and was expected back in Sydney Harbour this evening. Ragamuffin was another of the early withdrawals and found the going a lot easier heading back to Sydney this afternoon. The 36-foot Sydney-based sloop Andromeda made its way into Wollongong Harbour early today. A crewman asleep below deck was hit by its snapped mast and was taken to hospital with head injuries. The skipper, Gerard Melly, later estimated the damage bill would run to more than $30,000. Most of the retired yachts made or are making their way back to the Cruising Yacht Club in Sydney. While most crew members were well, Don Gandhi on Wyargene slipped into a rail and was being treated for injured ribs and back. Structural damage caused the withdrawal of last year's handicap winner, Challenge 3. And we've just heard that a crewman has been reported lost overboard and another yacht has sent out a top-level distress call as the depleted Sydney to Hobart fleet battles huge seas tonight. Yahoo 2 sent out a man overboard call and the relay ship Wayuna is making for her last known position. Another New South Wales yacht, Shenandoah 2, put out a mayday signal. She reported that she had lost the use of her engine and had water flooding through broken cockpit wind after either dragging anchors or breaking mooring lines. It wasn't until a power launch came on the scene that the yachts were able to be towed out of the shallows. They received only minor damage. The strong winds forced race organisers to cancel several regatta events today. The northerly winds brought about 11 millimetres of rain to Perth and the wet and windy weather is expected to continue overnight. The conditions also made things difficult for more than 100 windsurfers who are trying to qualify for the world... Cap ...bay today carried a sign asking for help in renovation and help came when it was recognised by Don Felton who built it in past glories of late as booming sponsorships in Sydney bred a super fleet of semi-pro sailors who have proved unbeatable for a decade. Though 24-year-old Mounts Bay sailor Scott Glaskin says our boys can overcome the Sydney siders' head start. The competition and the pressure makes for better crew work. I think our crew work at the moment is good and our sails are good, so all we can hope for is fair weather and we'll give them a good run for their money. 29 skiffs lined up for the start of the first of seven heats today. And looking on, Jack Cassidy, the man who led WA's dominance with seven national titles, the last of them 21 years ago. As expected, the New South Wales and Brisbane yachts led around the first mark, but on the spinnaker run, Perth's Glaskin was well up with the leaders. And as often happens to eastern state boats on the Swan,
Fremantle doctor gave them a rough introduction to local conditions. And this year they're looking pretty nice. The wind days are here to give us hell. And we have to face Sri Lanka as well. There'll be no denying that I'll be out there trying. But I got enough to shake us, time will tell. But watch out, boys, Australia's in the wind. We've got a team of big young angry men. So here comes the lowdown. It's gonna be a showdown. And I tell you now, we'll be in life then. However, if they can control it, the boat will go a lot faster, and she is really ripping along. But unfortunately, Condor started further up the line and was in a little bit better position. And uh, even though she may be going a bit slower, she's got slightly less distance to go, and uh, she doesn't get into these wild, uh, out-of-control situations like Apollo now broaching and flogging a spinnaker. It's rather terrifying to be on these boats when that happens, because... Uh, all that sail up there's like a circus tent flying around somebody's going to hold the other one corner of it with a, a sheet and uh, can be a bit disconcerting this as we watch the two of them there and uh, ragamuffin ragamuffin in view there ka70 uh, she'd be third heading towards south head at this stage that's apollo the Apollo now has a job ahead of it to get that spinnaker down and get the other sail chute in, uh, whereas uh, Condor and, uh, and uh, Ragamuffin only have to trim the sails they have. They're going to drop those big headsails. They're putting smaller headsails up inside the big one. On the bottom of your screen there, you can see the rounding tug. They must go around that before uh, turning right at the heads, as they say. And Condor, we can see as she travels straight past our commentary position now, is uh, uh, at least a boat length ahead and closer in to South Head. So in effect, she's, uh, she's got a bit of a break. One of the boats that looks as though it's doing pretty well looks like uh, Dr. Dan, uh, which seems to be lying about uh, fourth from the front at the moment, although a bit down to leeward. Very much smaller than the others and absolutely charging along there. And strangely enough, it looks as though uh, Spirit of Queensland uh, is uh, giving the office a good run for its money. So as we look at them there, it's Condor, Apollo, Ragamuffin. And they're pulling in that spinnaker now on Apollo. Back to Vengeance with the red spinnaker. And here's the shot from the tug. And Condor will be looking to come in as close as possible to the tug. We get a really nice shot from, from the tug in a moment. As, as indeed as it is, Condor, which wins the race to the heads. And maybe another 630 nautical miles, but it means a lot to these crews to, to make a good start. And Condor, without Spinnaker, certainly done that. A lot of work going on on the foredeck there, Ben. Yeah, that's, uh, that's hard work up there. We call that adventure land in the front, and down the back of fantasy land. There's Dr. Dan just on the screen now with uh, Spirit of Queensland behind her. <laughs> the 
Yeah, Dak, Dr. Dan did an excellent job there. That's just quite a tiny boat compared to the other Maxis, and there she is right in the middle of the Maxi fleet. Around comes Vengeance. Well, it took about nine and a half minutes. I think we might have a record. There's a freight train. Looks as though somebody's trailing something behind them. Their freight train's got a dinghy attached to her or something. Oh, yeah, it's, I don't know what that would be. I hope it's not one of the fellas falling over the side. Shot from above, and now there's the spectator fleet uh, virtually has a, has a free go. You can see why, uh, why the waters get so chopped up as they move ahead of the, the fleet. It's, a, it's Apollo and Ragamuffin you can see and just ahead of them is Condor as they make their way out of Sydney Heads and, and their way south we'll come back to check their progress after this short break small boats will handle the conditions outside see them handling the motorboat wash uh, it's going to get pretty wet for some of those uh, boats as they go south now coming around the uh, tug it's piccolo diamond cutter As we get back more through the fleet, the uh, people get more relaxed. They're not as serious, and this is more of the cruising division coming now. In amongst there was uh, Palmelia, sail number 2344. She uh, sailed out in the Palmelia race some years ago from uh, the UK to Perth. Back to the lead, though, and we're looking at Condor. Establishing a bit of a break. Rag him up in second. And you can see how rough it is there. They've all got their raincoats on and they'd all need them because they'll all be pretty wet by now. This is our power boat uh, ventures out bravely. Uh, it's quite a job holding a camera steady. And this sort of swell, it's a nor'east swell, but uh, complicating that is the chop from the spectator fleet. I would imagine the spectators won't follow the boats far today. And sometimes they follow them quite a long way down the coast, but uh, some of the spectators will be starting to feel a little bit woozy once they go around the corner. Yes, if you're going to head south in these sorts of conditions, uh, maxi boat, please. That's a more static view. It's nice and steady here on the land. And I wouldn't uh, envy the cameraman on board uh, Apollo's job from now on. That's the stern of Condor we're looking at right now. And she'll be feeling a little bit smug after making it to the heads first in what we think might have been a record time and all done with no spinnaker you see condor powering along now there with the kevlar sails a space age material that doesn't stretch and uh, this is almost essential on these very large yachts the curious thing about condor sails of course is that uh, bob bell was really sweating on them arriving uh, they only arrived in the last few days from overseas and when they did they were the wrong size and Sid Fisher very kindly uh, lent him his sail loft 
and Condor recut those sails. Very sporting gesture by Sid. There you can see even on the maxis the spray coming over the bows. leaders for a moment and uh, back to the rounding tug. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, carry on, Ben. We're seeing the, the, the very last of the uh, tail enders going around the tug right now and uh, the whole fleet is spread out across the ocean now. Uh, big ones, small ones, all sizes, feeling the, the um, strength of this southerly wind and the quite choppy sea. So... Uh, now the fleet will really start to spread out and maybe uh, after a few hours a few boats may retire. As we managed to see before if we can pick her up uh, the office uh, was without her mainsail. She dragged it down and uh, now it looks like they're trying to hoist it again. But, uh, see if we can get you a shot of that shortly. Yes, right now, though, we're going to take a short break and come back to Apollo in just a few moments. But uh, just before we do, we'll stay with the fleet a little bit longer as some of the smaller yachts negotiate that chop. Ready now to take a break. We'll come back in just a moment. A welcome cry when you're feeling real beat Calling the shell in the tropical heat oh, What's the word? And the cry goes out right across the state Would you bow an export might? Would you bow an export might? That's a pretty brisk start, Alistair. Yes, it was, uh, it was a good start, and the uh, small boats uh, came up very quickly behind the large boats. There were one or two uh, fairly exciting epics by the sounds and the noise and so on that we could hear from here, but uh, they were up there going well. I believe we've got David Solder standing by again on Apollo, and uh, David, if you can hear us, uh, yes. you were uh, taking some curious lines there with that uh, spinnaker up. She was uh, pulling you every which way. Oh, well, as they say, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. We, uh, we decided we'd go for it. I suppose it was a, a show of strength more than anything else. We were giving the other boats a, a bit on uh, waterline length, so we had to do something, I suppose, to keep up with them. And uh, as, as you'll see now, uh, we're all on the breeze, and uh, the bigger ones are just doing a little bit better. Condor has cleared out very nicely. Uh, New Zealand has sailed through our lee. Uh, we're sort of holding ragamuffin but there to windward and I think quite well placed is uh, freight train who are much higher. That is to say they've got an advantage when we tack around. Conditions are a bit lumpy. We've, we've cleared uh, the worst of the spectator wash. Well, we've got, still got plenty of yahoos. Uh, and it's settled down to um, sort of going to windward in a washing machine more or less. Yes, it sounds remarkably similar to last year. Is that how it feels to you? Sorry, I can't hear. I say it uh, sounds similar to last year's start. I think we might have lost David for the moment. But uh, there she is, Apollo. As we move back through the fleet, we might try and pick up the office now. And that's not her. It's actually Newcastle Flyer. Newcastle Flyer uh, should do fairly well uh, with that name. Uh, she's supposedly pretty quick. There's Anaconda in the uh, distance there. Um, pretty good round the world sort of yacht, but uh, for the Sydney Hobart race, she's a bit heavy. She's been backing up year after year, hasn't she? Yeah, she's a good stare. 
but uh, you mentioned before Ben some of these uh, yachts especially towards the back of the fleet really only make the trip for the fun of it they're not uh, feeling that competitive oh that's true they do make it for the fun of it and a, a race like this must really uh, make them think uh, why that why did we do this because uh, a lot of them go down for the like it's the Hobart race is really an institution rather than a, a solid yacht race and uh, and a lot of people go down there just for the institution now I personally would rather go down by jet, but uh, some of these people are more adventurous than I, and they really enjoy their Hobart race and look forward to it every year. And, and I say good luck to them, and, and they're the sort of people that make uh, this race what it is. Alistair, it's a tremendous uh, learning experience for yachtsmen to go down uh, on a Sydney to Hobart. Um, uh, are most of the people who do make the trip well qualified to do so? No, not uh, not most of them. In fact, far from most of them. On the on the bigger yachts, yes, the uh, crews have all done it before and have a lot of uh, ocean miles under their belts. But on the smaller yachts, uh, they are required to have uh, a minimum of two suitably qualified people on board, navigator, for instance, and skipper. Uh, but the rest of the crew uh, quite often uh, will be doing it for the first time. Uh, some young people, for instance, there's one, one boat uh, punch is in the race this year. And uh, Barry Lewis, who owns the boat, has done it fairly often but this time his wife's taking her down he's doing the babysitting while she's away right next year when it's a southern cross cup year uh, the cruising yacht club's expecting a fleet of close to 200 and the regulation is that what at least two of those aboard that's must have been to hobart before that's, that's right. going to be interesting finding enough uh, people to fulfill that regulation it, it certainly is i mean there are plenty of people who've done the hobart race but there are not necessarily plenty of people who are qualified to take charge of a yacht on the way down see the conditions out there or anything but uh, tranquil and I don't envy the journey ahead of the yachts below about uh, 12 13 meters the smaller ones uh, I think uh, topaz and knuckle duster are the smallest they're about 9.1 and they're in for a bumpy trip but they're courageous sailors they wouldn't do it unless they'd thought it through they know what's ahead of them There you see lining, uh, lining the gap, a big crowd watching them go by. We'll come back and check the progress in just a moment. That's the sight as the fleet makes its way south and past that cargo vessel and plenty of white caps out there. It's, it's pretty breezy. As we move back through the fleet and tell us a little bit more about what the fleet can expect on its way south, Mike Bailey again. Conditions have certainly been ideal for the start, getting those maxi yachts out very quickly through the heads. And in fact, all of the fleet now cleared the heads. But they're now getting into the uh, period where the seas are going to be picking up. They're going to be quite heavy right down the New South Wales coast. I've mentioned a couple of times a strong low pressure system just off the southeastern tip of the continent. It is moving further to the south. As it does so, the winds will very slowly moderate. But of course, the sea swell is going to be up right along the New South Wales coast. So some tough times are likely to be ahead of this fleet as it makes its way further down the New South Wales coast on the run to Hobart. Conditions, of course, will continue certainly to suit the maxi yachts, getting the better of it out there at the moment, heading well out to sea before making the turn to head down towards the coast and uh, Hobart finally in a few days time. Talking of just how long it does take to make Hobart, the record time that the yachts will be out to beat is of course held by Kealoa. It's been held for almost a decade now. It was in 1975 that Kealoa made it down the coast in just over two and a half days. It happened when weather conditions were uh, favorable for the yachts. They were generally northeast to northwesterly winds. Let's look back now at that 1975 race and the weather conditions they called virtually ideal. It was a vintage year for the Sydney to Hobart. 1975 and a new record number of entries. 102 yachts faced the starter. The start. It was International Women's Year, and the event attracted its first all-female crew. Vicky Willman led them on the 38-foot Barbarian. And it was the year when the weather smiled on the big yachts. Nine of them finished inside Helsall's previous record, and six of those inside of three days. Winds were light southeasterly early on Boxing Day, and had shifted to the east for the start. Ballyhoo made the best of it, and was first through the Sydney heads. 
Windward Passage was in close pursuit down the coast, with Kealoha third. On the first night out, winds shifted to the northeast and spinnakers were set for a fast run. The nor'easter hit 20 knots the next day, with the duel for leadership narrowing to Windward Passage versus Kealoha. pressure system directing the good downwind conditions continued to strengthen in the Tasman Sea. A cold front moving from the west further enhanced the northerly flow behind the high. It was a dream weather picture for the leading yachts, often topping speeds of 20 knots. Kealoha made the best of it down the Tasmanian coast and passed Windward Passage. Jim Kilroy and his crew were across the line in Hobart at 2.36 a.m. on December the 29th. An enthusiastic crowd ignored the darkness to salute the fact that the previous record for the event was shattered by almost 11 hours. Windward Passage was there just 23 minutes later, and early leader Ballyhoo was only two hours behind. Kealoha's record is still the one to beat almost a decade later. It was two days, 14 hours, 36 minutes and 56 seconds. And it just wouldn't have been possible without that ideal weather. Well, it's not bad weather to get them out the heads, but it's not ideal weather down the New South Wales coast as the yachts head off. Pretty stiff southerly and vengeance in front of us now is one of the maxis who'll have a slightly more comfortable trip than most. Plenty of experience on board too. Welker. Yes, we have a look at some of the statistics of this yacht. Skipper, Bernie Lewis. And she's now getting on a bit, six years old. And some experience there, 188 Hobarts between them. And line honours in 1981. This is uh, Cole Betts' um, Jubilee Hobart. I think he's done 24 and he wasn't going to do another one until he discovered this was his 25th, so he's got to do this one and he's on board. The crew sitting on the gunnel there. Ben, you might like to explain uh, the weight distribution there. That sort of helps, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, so if the boat doesn't heel over, of course, it goes faster. And uh, the two things that stop the boat heeling over are the lead ballast in the keel and the weight, the live weight of the gear and equipment and crew on board. And uh, on modern boats, the crew park themselves along the fence like that, like a whole lot of crows sitting on a fence. And it does make the boat more stable and make it go faster. In the old days, we used to all go off, watch and go to bed. but in some of the more competitive small boats, the crew sleep up on deck on the rail. And uh, even below deck, uh, they try and arrange the sleeping uh, conditions so that they all sleep on the weather side. That's correct. When the boat tacks, the crew wake up and they all get out of bed and go over the other side and <laughs> go back to sleep again. Well, they all seem to be um, heading out to sea. What's, what's the, the tactics from here? Well, I would imagine the tactics from here would be a weather forecasting tactic whereby we have to figure out uh, which way the low pressure is moving and how that will affect the wind because if the wind goes to the uh, southeast of course the boats that go out to sea will be at an advantage but if the boat uh, the wind goes to the southwest then the ones that are staying close to the coast will be at an advantage so it's up to the navigators and the skippers on board the boat now to uh, figure out what they think the weather conditions are, would, weather conditions are going to do and uh, place their boat accordingly. Sailing a boat on the wind like this is like a huge chess game and, uh, and all these great big yachts sailing around here are expensive chess pieces. Traditionally, the route south involves sticking to the rum line. Are they, why is it that uh, skippers are reluctant to veer away? Well, the rum line type sailing, tacking back and forth along the run line, me me means that you're, you're never really, you're always the closest to where you want to go and it's a, it's a, a very conservative, safe, way to sail a boat to come back to the rum line all the time but my own personal opinion is the rum line isn't from Sydney to Hobart the rum line always is from where you are to Hobart and uh, so you have to